Amen. Brother Jameson, would you open us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, just thank you for the evening that you've given us to gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ and worship you as a corporate body. We just uh, pray for our country during this time. Just pray that uh, your hand would be upon uh, your church and that uh, you would just help us to spread the gospel to a world that is uh, concerned and, and alarmed at uh, things going around us and, th and a world that is more aware of uh, the brevity of life. We just pray that you'd uh, speak through Pastor this evening. Uh, encourage us with uh, the scriptures and help us to uh, help equip us to go forth into the world as we leave this place this evening and just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would turn to page 132. Now, Dad said he was going to preach for only 30 minutes. You can be seated. Turn to page 132. Our next congregation will be There is Power in the Blood. But since Dad's only preaching 30 minutes, we're doing 10 congregationals tonight. <laughs> I'm kidding. But well, we are going to do a couple here. And there's power in the blood. It's good to know that. I hope that you're saved. And if you are saved, then you can sing this out because we've trusted Jesus and we, we can rest in the power that's in his blood. So sing this with me, page 132. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. chance for a nap if dad's only preaching 30 minutes tonight but but uh i don't know some of you might pull that off anyway but I, I hope not but let's sing this out glory to his name down at the cross and uh we'll we'll uh have before dad preaches our youth choir is going to come it's a very small group they're going to be spread out but they're going to sing a special before dad preaches tonight after we do down at the cross page 140 <laughs>
going to come. They're going to sing, God is good all the time. And then think the old highway before dad preaches tonight. Standing in front of Jacob, he lost his bridges. <laughs>
about 35 minutes starting. Amen. Okay. Y'all notice that Clay repeated himself four times about the length of the message tonight. Now, we only are counting preaching time. Okay, all the other things that, that don't really count. I, I, I'm going to get that down. I did want to say that uh, the other day uh, I felt sorry for Allie. Uh, most of y'all know that Allie talks quite a bit. And uh, matter of fact, she has a hard time being quiet. And the other day we were riding across the pasture. And uh, we, the rest of us who were riding, we were getting no relief whatsoever. We were not having any opportunity to talk because Allie was with us. And so if Allie's watching this evening, uh, Allie, you'll have to confirm this is the absolute truth. And so I said to Allie, I said, Allie, I want you to be quiet. We're going to play the quiet game. I want you to not say another word until we get to that gate over there. And it was only about a half a mile. And I said, I want you to be totally quiet until we get to the gate over there. And so I turned my back to her. She was riding, of course, behind me a ways. And uh, the further we went, once in a while, I would glance back. And uh, her face began to get red. And uh, I thought, she, if, I don't, if I don't stop the game, she's going to absolutely explode and so before I could call the game off, she went ahead and gave up and said that she had rather experience defeat than to go another step without talking. And so uh, I think Allie and I have something uh, in common. I want to uh, share something with you tonight that I hope and pray will be a blessing to you. I want you to stand with me and open your Bibles to Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter 4. As I'm looking at my watch, it is about 6.20 right now, and uh, I do want to, since Clay has announced it four times, uh, try to preach a 35-minute message. Philippians chapter 4, I want to go ahead and give you uh, what could be a title for this evening's message. If I were going to entitle the message, I would call it, My Time to Shine. My Time to Shine and then right below that, two simple words, let's rejoice. Let's rejoice. Now, I know some of you are saying, preacher, are you going to try to convince all of us that we need to be rejoicing in this difficult time uh, that we are in? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. The Bible says rejoice evermore. The Bible says always be rejoicing. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. In Philippians chapter 4, look there with me at verse number 4. The Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, Rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things." Those things which you both have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. I believe that in this crisis, it is our time to shine. Father, we are grateful to you. We love you and praise you. Thank you for the joy we have in Jesus. God, thank you for our young people. I just pray you bless their lives, God, and Lord, and that you might grow them into godly young men and godly young women that will carry on, Lord, the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll just praise you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I did want to say I appreciate you uh, practicing spacing. Uh, I know with a lot of people at home and watching uh, the, the message online, it, it does give extra room, and I appreciate that, and, and you're trying as best as you can to avoid contact, and uh, I do appreciate that. We want to abide as much as is possible uh, with this distancing, and so I thank you for that. I want to share with you this evening 
something that I think is very, very important. The Bible tells us numerous times, as a matter of fact, I could not, um, I could not give the number of times without taking uh, a lot of time and, and counting, but there are numerous times that the Bible gives us a command to rejoice or to be joyful. As a matter of fact, in most of the cases where the Bible gives us that command, it is in the midst of difficulty or in the midst of trials. And therefore, the God of peace and the God of joy and, and such as that, he calls us to rejoice even in times that are difficult or as we are today in a time of national crisis. Now, I want you to keep in mind that joy and peace are inseparable. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 5 with me. And let me show you something there that you will be somewhat familiar with. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, we have there written for us the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I know that you may know this, may be elementary to you, but I want you to notice that in verse 22 it says, But the fruit of the Spirit, and it's talking in singular terms. In other words, there is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, it gives different elements or aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, but all of these that are named are actually one in that they make up the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so you cannot really separate peace and joy or peace and rejoicing when you read the Word of God. Now, I believe that based upon our current dilemma in America today that we are facing certainly what one may call uncharted waters. As a matter of fact, I mentioned very briefly last Sunday morning about Joshua in Joshua chapter 3 and verse number 4 where they were getting ready to cross over Jordan and Joshua said, we have not been this way here to four, simply meaning that we are getting ready to do something that we've never done before. We've never traveled this path before. Now, as we realize that, we know that he was not the first to face what we might call uncharted waters or paths that had not already been traveled. As a matter of fact, uh, Pastor Clay has been doing on Sunday evenings uh, the book of Genesis and preaching to us about these great men in the Bible that, uh, that once again God called to do things that had never been done before. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 14, God told Noah to do something that had never been done before. He said, I want you to make thee an ark. In Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1, God told Abraham to go to a land to which he knew not. And in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 8, the Bible says he went out not knowing whether he went. Moses faced an impossible task, if you will. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 10, where God said to him, I will send thee unto Pharaoh. I could go on and on and give Old Testament illustrations of where men were called by God to go places they had never been before and do things that they had never done before. And in America today, we are facing that very thing. Most of us, as a matter of fact, if I were to uh, just the average Sunday morning crowd here at Lindsay Chapel, I would say there would be very, very few that lived uh, during World War II. Now, some, we do have some people that are old enough to have lived in that time, and at the time of rationing, where there were restrictions on uh, the American people, you, even if you had money, you couldn't just go out and buy what you wanted because there were things that were being rationed. There were restrictions. And we've never seen a time like that until now. And now in America, we are uh, doing something. We are being required to do something that we have never faced before. Uh, I believe in some ways it can be good for us because it will help us to practice some self-discipline. But the fact of the matter is, we have not been this way here to four. Now, as I look over in the New Testament, I see in John chapter 3, where God told, Jesus told his disciples 
to go and share the light, the life-giving light to a people. But I thought something that was rather odd. In John chapter 3 and verse number 19, even in, when Jesus sent them to carry the gospel to these people, he also told them that these people loved darkness rather than light. And yet God sent them, the Lord Jesus sent them with the life-changing gospel. And I think about the Apostle Paul in, in uh, the book of Acts. Uh, the Bible says that God said to him, I will show you how great things you will suffer for my name's sake. We see that all through the Bible, people were called to do things they had not done before and go places they had not been before. And yet I, I feel a sense of rejoicing, and I'll use the Apostle Paul to make this point. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, and I know I'm giving a lot of scripture this evening and not waiting on you to get there. That's fine. I'm doing that for the sake of time. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, there in the, uh, the, about verse number 6 and following is where the apostle Paul said, uh, I am now ready. The time of my departure is at hand. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And then in verse number 8, he said, and there is a crown laid up for me, the crown of righteousness. And when I read that, I can almost sense a spirit of joy or rejoicing on the Apostle Paul's mind as he says, I've done what God has told me to do. He was imprisoned at the time, but he said, I am now ready. Uh, I've done what God told me to do, and there's a crown laid up for me. I believe that in his heart, he was already rejoicing in the Lord. You see, we face difficulty today, but as we look back, we can learn from these great men of God that they all persevered. They all made it through. Now, let me just say this to you, and I, I ask this question often. I don't think you would be here tonight if the answer were not yes, but if you're saved, say it in tonight. Amen. Then we know we're going to make it through, okay? Now, you might say, but preacher, I mean, what if this and what if that? And we can all do a lot of what ifs. But the fact of the matter is, those of us who are saved, the issue is not our making it through. The issue, as I mentioned last Sunday morning in just a little bit different way, is how we respond as we travel through the difficulty that lays before us. We will persevere, and we will survive. You might say, preacher, how can you be so certain of that? Because Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 12, he said, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. We have a God who has made us a promise. And whatever we have committed to him, he is able to keep that until the last day. And if you committed your life to Christ, then we know that persevering is not the issue. The issue is how we respond. I love to read in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Daniel, about the three Hebrew children. Now, some of you might say, Preacher, but you didn't tell us how we were going to make it through this. Well, let me just give you the options. In uh, Daniel chapter 3 and verse number 17, the three Hebrew children, as they were getting ready to be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace, they responded to the king. They responded to the situation, and this is what they said. They said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. Now, I know it's a small crowd tonight, but I do need a little bit of help. So how many of you believe, if you're saved tonight, that our God is able to deliver us? Say amen. amen. But then he goes further. He says, and our God will deliver us out of thine hand. And so they knew that they would be delivered one way or the other because we serve a God who made a promise. You see, I believe that every example that I've just shared with you simply reveal the orchestrating hand of God as he, uh, as he uh, put these things together so that he would receive glory and honor through the response of those involved. Now, as we think about that, I'm reminded of John chapter 9, where the Bible says that this young man was born blind. And I mentioned this again last Sunday morning, but just let me say this. Even the disciples of Christ said, who did sin, 
this man or his parents that he was born blind? But Jesus responded and said, neither of them. It was not him nor his parents. He was born blind so that, and I'll just give it the way he gave it. He says, but that the work of God should be made manifest in him. You know what Jesus was actually saying? He was saying, I orchestrated this whole thing. In other words, none of it was by accident. None of it slipped up on me. I orchestrated the whole thing. The young man was born blind, not because of his parents' sin, not because of his sin, but for this very moment so that I could heal him and that the power of God would be made known in this situation. Let me just pose a question to you. Could it be possible that God has allowed or orchestrated this crisis that we are in today? Could it be that he has orchestrated it, that he has ordained it or allowed it so that in some way that he might get the glory in it and through it? And I believe the answer is yes. We know that it certainly did not slip up on God as Clay mentioned this morning. And he is not panicked because of it. I believe that the hand of God is clearly seen in the events that take place in our world you see, no one can say with certainty as to why. We don't know all the answers to that. But I wonder if it might be so that we might turn our eyes upon Jesus. And that doesn't mean that we're ignoring the facts. It simply means that we choose to walk by faith and not necessarily be controlled by the situation or the facts. You know, Pastor Clay and I are out almost every day and we're moving around. We have to go from place to place and take care of our livestock and such as that. And then we're out moving around in the ministry. And guys, I got to tell you, over the last couple of weeks, uh, it, it has been somewhat challenging to us uh, to be able to uh, continue to encourage people when it seems that the order of the day is discouragement and, and, and people that are being just despondent over what's going on. And I believe that this is our time to shine as children of God. And I believe that God has orchestrated this and, and has literally allowed all of this to come to pass so that God's people could stand on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 3 and verse 11, For other foundation hath no man laid other than that which is laid in Christ Jesus our Lord. I believe that God has given us an opportunity to let his light shine. He says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may glorify, let your works, your light so shine before men that they will glorify our Father in heaven. Guys, listen, God has given us an opportunity to shine that we might rejoice in all that's going on. Did you know that there is no circumstance in life except when we sin, that should be able to take away our joy if we truly know Christ. Now, I know there are people that have gone through terrible difficulties. Uh, I look back at our own family uh, a number of few years ago when the children were injured in the accident. And, and that, was a, that was a difficult time for us. But even in that, I think that we all can say this as a church family that we still all came together during those times. And though we prayed and asked God literally for a miracle, we were always rejoicing in the fact that we knew that God was in absolute control. You see, this is our time to shine. Now, I noticed a look on some of your face when I said there is no circumstance in life except when we sin that should be able to take away our joy if we are truly a child of God. And you might say, what do you mean by that? Well... If we've got unconfessed sin in our lives, then certainly we're not going to be able to experience the joy of the Lord. We're not going to be able to rejoice in everything. That's why uh, the psalmist David in Psalms 51 in verse number 12 said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He had sin in his life, and until he confessed his sin, he was not able to experience the joy of the Lord. And so he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. We see also that, and there are many other examples of that. You know, there was a time in David's life when his child died. And I've shared this at funeral services, and, and you might say, well, that's a morbid way to introduce the, the verse here. Uh, but I've shared this at funeral services. 
After David sinned and Nathan came to David and God used Nathan to reveal the sin and David repented of his sin. But as a consequence of that, David had a young child by Bathsheba that died. The Bible says that when the word came to David from his servants that the young child had died. And you can read this for yourself in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 20. And the Bible says that David cleaned himself up. He put on a new change of clothes and he, bit, he began to rejoice and praise God. And his servants said, David, we don't understand. While your son was alive, you fasted and prayed and you wept for him. And, and when you find out that he died, you began to rejoice. And David said this. He said, I cannot bring him back, but I can go and be with him. And because of that, I will rejoice. God's people should rejoice even in times of great difficulty. I mentioned about sin in your life and not uh, and being a block, if you will, to our rejoicing. But we also know that when we sin, that God offers us forgiveness and restoration. And that's why in 1 John 1, 9, he says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, I want to I want to get to something very quickly here. And this is really the heart of the message. I believe that we have just reason to rejoice. I believe that if we rejoice and when we run into people, uh, maybe even tonight or tomorrow or as the week goes by, if they see you and I as children of God rejoicing in the Lord and being grateful for the things that God has done, I believe that it can be a most effective witness and also be a door opener for us to share the gospel of Jesus, just as Pastor Clay mentioned this morning. And so I want to give you some simple reasons why we should rejoice. And one of these will overlap until last week's message. I believe that we should rejoice because of who God is, because of his character. Do you remember last week I mentioned that our God is a loving God? 1 John 4, 8, the Bible says, for God is love. He is a merciful God, the Bible says in Lamentations 3.22. It is the mercy of God that we are not consumed every day, for his compassions fail not he is a kind God to us. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. The Bible says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He is an all-powerful God. Revelation 19, 6. The Bible says, the Lord God reigneth, uh, omnipotent reigneth. God is all-knowing. God is all-present. Proverbs 15. The Bible says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Did you know that even Genesis chapter 50 and verse number 20, as Pastor Clay was preaching the other day about Joseph, the Bible says that, that when it seemed that everything was coming against Joseph, the world was literally coming down around him. And at the end of that, God said, what they meant for evil, God meant for good. Romans 8, 28, the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. And to those who are called according to his purpose, we ought to rejoice because of the character of our God, because who he is. And let me give you another reason. We need to rejoice in the midst of this difficulty that we're facing today because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. I love this. If you're saved tonight, it is because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And when he said it is finished in John 19.30, he meant it is finished. Finished. The Bible says in Romans 5 8, but God commended his love toward us, ended while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. You see, our final destination is already fixed, and we need to rejoice in that. You know, oftentimes, and, and I hear Pastor Clay talk about this, it's a blessing sometimes to be able to tell people, well, it really doesn't matter. What do you mean it really doesn't matter? Well, it really doesn't matter because this world is not my home anyway. I'm just passing through here because my eternity, because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, my eternity is already fixed. I heard it said one time, I do not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And then we need to rejoice in the very presence of the Holy Spirit. You see... We have the Holy Spirit with us. John 16, 13, the Bible says he will guide you into all truth. And then in John 14, 26, he shall bring all these things to your remembrance. And you might say, what things will he bring to our remembrance? Well, I love to uh, just sit sometimes and meditate 
and let the word let let the Holy Spirit of God bring things to my remembrance. I love John chapter ten and verse ten, where Jesus said, "I come that you might have life, and that you might have life more abundantly." I love the scripture in John 14 where Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We need to rejoice today because our eternity is already fixed. You know the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.9, and it's actually a quote from Isaiah 64. It says, I have not seen nor ear heard, and neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for those that love him. We also need to rejoice because of our future with the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8.18, uh, when I look at this particular verse, the Lord really pricks my heart. I was talking a, a few weeks ago with a man who is dying and uh, you might, I know some people think, man, that's awful. Uh, but you know what? To, to be able to sit and talk with a, a person who knows Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life, and they have no fear of what's going to take place because they know where they are going. And as I was talking uh, to this man who, unless God does a miracle, he, he has maybe a few months left here upon this earth. And he, he quoted this verse to me in Romans 8, 18. He said, for I reckon that the suffering of this time is not to be compared to the glory that, we, that will be revealed in us. And as I think about that, we should rejoice in the fact that we have a future with Christ. And once again, I believe that's what Paul meant when he said, there is a crown laid up for me. We need to rejoice because we can pray and know that God will hear and answer our prayers. You know, I know that this crisis uh, has divided, if you will. It has splintered our congregation. But I know that's only for a time, and we will all be able to come back together and worship together and spend time uh, just, just uh, loving each other and conversing with one another, which we are somewhat prohibited from doing right now. But even as I think about that, we can pray. And those that are at home and not being able to get out and come to the house of God, you don't have to be in the house of God to pray. You don't have to be in the, the, the house of prayer to pray. We have that great promise that we can pray and that God will hear us. John 16, 24, he says, Ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. John 15, 7 he says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, pray without ceasing. Did you know that one of the things that the disciples asked Jesus for, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And then in Luke chapter 18, he says, men ought always to pray. Paul and Silas prayed while they were in prison and they sang praises to God. We ought to thank God every day. We ought to rejoice every day because he promises that he will answer the prayer of the righteous. He says in James chapter 5, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And it's not that we are righteousness in ourselves, but that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And then we should rejoice in this crisis. And you might say, but preacher, are you ignoring the facts? Are you, are you minimalizing the, 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 the seriousness of what we are in? No, I'm not in any way. But I know that we have to acknowledge facts, but we have to live by faith. And, and it, that's not a contradiction for me to acknowledge the facts, but yet to live by faith. I can't do anything about the facts, but I can live by faith, by the grace of God. So we need to rejoice because of his word. Listen, I do want you to follow me to a few places in a moment. But in Psalms 19, verse 105, the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Man, I praise the Lord that his word is a light that literally illuminates our path wherever we go. And we need to rejoice because we have the light of the word of God. Go to Psalms 19. I'm going to wait on you to get to Psalms 19. I'm going to read something to you there that a number of years ago I actually used in a series. Let me read this to you. We need to rejoice in that we have the Word of God. 
He says the law of the Lord is perfect in Psalms 19 in verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Brother and sister, tonight we need to rejoice in the Lord and rejoice always. I know that some of us may be a little bit reluctant to just go out and share the word of God, though I believe that we should. But you don't have to know the Roman road to salvation. You don't have to have a large passage of scripture memorized. I believe in this time of crisis, and I mean, I, I really believe with all my heart that this is a time that God has given us to shine. Because all we have to do is go out into this world right now with all of its despondency and despair and even depression. Go out into the world and have a smile on your face and a song in your heart. And listen, if you go about rejoicing, I can assure you somebody is going to ask you what in the world are you smiling about? What in the world are, are, are you so happy about? Don't you know what's going on? And at that point, you can tell them what's really going on. We live in a world where people need to know Jesus Christ. Did you know that, that God orchestrates all things? And so I have to believe that he has orchestrated this particular crisis to give you and I the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus with a lost world. And so I want to encourage you this evening as we leave this place and go out into the world. And we're all going to be going different places tomorrow. I think that's rather obvious. Let your light shine. Have a smile on your face and a song in your heart. Be rejoicing while everybody else has got a long face. I, I, the other day when I was at the store, Clay and I, we were, we were almost uh, required to go to Walmart. Our wives asked us to go there and pick up some things for them. And uh, we're so full of cow medicine that we probably wouldn't get that anyway. Uh, and so we, we're exposed. And so we were being punished by having to go uh, to Walmart. Uh, and, and it's amazing. As I looked around, people were scurrying from here to there and grabbing what they could grab. And it was rather odd to me. But there was literally a spirit, if you've been there, I believe you would agree, there's a spirit of, of despondency out there. And so if you'll just walk around smiling and maybe singing a little tune, and you might say, well, I don't sing very well. Well, just let one come out anyway. We need to rejoice in the Lord, and again, I say rejoice, and I promise somebody will ask you, do you not know what's going on in the world? And then you can tell them what's really going on. This is our time to shine. This is our time to rejoice. This is our time to give God the glory. He says, whatsoever things that we think on, you can read this in Philippians chapter 4, ought to be the things of God and not the things of this world. I can't hardly wait till tomorrow when we get out on the road and we're going to go feeding. And I'm just going to have this big smile on my face because I want to practice what I preach. And I, I just can't wait for the first person to come up to me and say, don't you know what's going on? And then I'll be able to practice what I preach to you this evening. We need to rejoice evermore because our God is an eternal God and he has promised us a place in heaven. Let's all stand together. Miss Kristen, if you'll make your way to the piano, I don't ever want to close a service without giving an opportunity for somebody to make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that it's a small crowd, and I know that the odds of you being lost and being here on a Sunday night with a virus going on is pretty slim. You're probably saved or you wouldn't be here tonight, but maybe not. The Bible says many are called, but you're chosen. And there will be those in that day that cry out, Lord, Lord. And yet he will say to them, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. It's my prayer that you're saved. And those of you that may be watching at home, if you're not saved tonight, listen, you can get saved in the privacy of your own home. You don't have to be in the house of God to get saved as long as you're in the presence of God.
And so if you're not saved tonight, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. Miss Kristen's going to play. And if you need to come, you come right away. We're not going to go long. If you need to come, you come. Whatever God has spoke to your heart about, if you need to come, you walk down this aisle. Just a few moments and you're going to close the service. Life's so abundant and free. Think about this course now. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full at his wonderful face. And the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. She's going to play through the course, or just through the course. If you need to come, you come. Praise the Lord. May God bless you. And uh, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, there's no better place to be than to be in the house of God. Brother Chet, would you make your way up and uh, dismiss us in prayer? And uh, we will be keeping in touch with all of you literally from day to day as things unfold. Uh, but as it stands right now, we will be here Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock for Bible study. And we'll practice distancing. And uh, with all that said, Brother Chet, dismiss us, please. Let us pray. Father, we just come to you tonight, Lord. We just pray that you are lifted up and glorified. And Father, that you would shine bright in a time that uh, the world just seems to be uh, in chaos, Lord. And Father, just pray that uh, anybody that's lost would uh, find somebody that would be able to pray with them and, and uh, share your word with them, Lord, and uh, that they would give their life to you. Father, as we go out this week, uh, for everybody to be safe, but yet to uh, shine our light bright, as Tim has preached tonight, that people would look at us and say, what's different about you than it is me? And they would ask. Father, we just pray for that opportunity. All that we ask in your holy and blessed name. Amen. Amen.